Hello everyone. I think we can start. It's one o'clock uh, Central European time. So, um, hello from Zagreb here in Croatia. I'm happy today that we are having the event organized by the University Computing Center Srcen and European Distance E-Learning Network Eden within Open Education Week, which is uh, celebrated every year with aim to foster and enhance the open education uh, in, uh, um, in whole uh, education through uh, whole levels of education. Um, today, we are uh, having a topic of uh, how to promote academic integrity in online education. I think a uh, very uh, high uh, topic, very highly on agenda. And uh, with us are today uh, speakers, uh, experts in this field, and I'm very happy that uh, they have found time and uh, to join us today. So today's speakers are Frederick uh, Lito, Professor Emeritus from University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and President of Brazilian Association of Distance Education, Dr. Eileen Glendinning, Academic Manager for Student Experience at Coventry University UK, and Chris Edwards, a lecturer at the Institute of Educational Technology at Open University of uh, UK. So, um, why we are having this topic today? Because uh, with the uh, immersion of internet and the uh, avail availability of uh, lots of materials and resources, uh, we have to uh, talk also about issue of a possible uh, plagiarism or uh, fabrication or dishonesty uh, and the question of uh, academic integrity which has brought uh, this uh, possibility of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, using a lot of materials uh, available on the internet. Also with online education we have to set the, the goals and uh, the, the policies so, uh, lots of educational institutions are facing challenge how to solve and prevent issue of plagiarism and how to make academic integrity highly valuable uh, standard in the academic world uh, uh, again. So, uh, today we have three presentations which will provide different focuses and uh, different parts uh, regarding this topic. We have in the first presentation a little bit a little bit more about uh, what is academic integrity and uh, yeah, issues about this. Uh, in the second presentation, we will have the, the results of research uh, done within the uh, acad uh, European um, uh, uh, area of, on the topic of plagiarism. And then in the last presentation, we will hear experience from the Open University of UK, uh, also about the project Tesla, who is dealing uh, with one of issues within uh, academic integrity. So, uh, at the beginning, I would like to announce uh, Professor Frederick Lito, Professor Emeritus from University of Sao Paulo, who was Professor of Communication there for till 2005 and then has retired. Um, professor Lito has really um, a very fruitful and productive career uh, and still is very active and I'm very happy that he has joined us today. Um, within his numerous achievements, I would just uh, emphasize that uh, he uh, has done lots of books, but uh, maybe to um, uh, distinguish, uh, to, to uh, emphasize the book on learning at the distance, uh, which was awarded the prize for the best book in informatics and technology by Brazilian Publishers Association. And maybe that in 2014, the Open Courseware Consortium selected him to be recipient of the prize for lifetime achievements in recognition of his efforts to expand access to learning. The uh, title of his presentation today is Plagiarism in Open and Online Learning. So, uh, Professor Lito, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I am delighted to be participating uh, in this seminar. Uh, I was delighted especially to have received the invitation because I had the opportunity to visit Zagreb uh, in 19, 
1969, and I found it a delightful university and delightful city. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to be back in contact with you. And of course, uh, I'm grateful also for the opportunity to talk about a subject that's uh, very close to my heart. Uh, I've been studying the question of plagiarism in the academic world uh, for uh, some five years now, because there's very little on academic plagiarism in the Portuguese language. Uh, I've lived here in Brazil now for 45 years and, and taught at the University of Sao Paulo, and uh, we have serious problems, probably no, no greater than in other countries, uh, with plagiarism in the academic world. And so uh, when it deals in plagiarism and distance education, I am uh, doubly interested. So let me move ahead. We have an association of all the participants, the professionals in distance education here in Brazil, and that's the, we call it ABED, the Brazilian Association of Distance Education. So uh, let's see, to advance my slides, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, we'll talk about plagiarism and open and online learning. This is a, a, a photo of our capital uh, in, in Brasilia. First, I'll talk about some definitions and types of current academic plagiarism. I'll address the question of, is there more plagiarism in higher education now since the advent of the internet? What are the factors which are encouraging the practice of plagiarism, despite uh, so many rules against it? And is plagiarism detection software a solution with no draw drawbacks whatsoever, or are there some drawbacks indeed? And finally, do interventions like uh, ethics training really work? We'll talk about what the literature says about that. And then finally, there'll be a bibliography uh, which permits people to uh, uh, follow up on some of the uh, remarks I've made here. And the simple, basic, um, we say in English, a boilerplate uh, definition of plagiarism that is in the most simple terms. It's an act using the work, the ideas, the words or graphics of another author, and they're thereby submitting it as being your own, without attributing the original source or having the first author's permission. It must be distinguished from copyright because copyright is a legal matter with possible commercial and most likely commercial interests. Plagiarism, on the other hand, is an ethical matter, not involving money necessarily, or not directly, uh, perhaps indirectly, involving acknowledging one's debt to another author through attribution to his or her work. In the realm outside of academia, in literature, journalism, music, cinema, uh, the motivation is to play for plagiarism is for pecuniary gain, to make money, to make money. In the world of academia, what uh, the world, the, the rules are around the question, or the, the mission is one of certification of knowledge, certification of competencies in original work, and hence the motivation is to try to appear more competent and original than one really is and hence it's dishonest. And consequently, it makes the certifying institution into a liar, which is not very good, you know, if one plagiarizes. Now, there are differing degrees of plagiarism. The most serious, or what we can call hard plagiarism as opposed to soft, begins with serial plagiarism, uh, uh, recidivism, where a plagiarist continually produces work based on plagiarism. This is the most serious crime of all. And it has to be noted in the literature uh, so that people uh, uh, are, are, are aware of, of a chronic uh, plagiarists. Also, ghost written work, where one pays uh, to have a, a thesis or a paper written for him or her, either contracted through or purchased online uh, from a library of, of, of uh, prepared works. Uh, also, very serious, the reproduction of an entire text verbatim. A line by line, or perhaps word by word for word. The fabrication of references. Well, you may write your own paper, but to make it look stronger than it really is, you fabricate bibliographic references uh, to boost uh, your prestige with the reader of your paper. Sentences or paragraphs copied verbatim, also a no-no, something not to do. Quoting or paraphrasing or citing improperly, uh, consciously, because what we're, we're talking about all of these in the serious line, uh, is intentional plagiarism. Uh, the, the idea is to fool uh, your reader. And as we go towards the more soft plagiarism, uh, it's usually uh, innocent and may be punished initially, um, but then a person should not uh, 
commit an offense uh, of plagiarizing uh, thereafter. Patch writing also uh, moderately seriously weaving together pieces from different sources. It's also called mosaic plagiarism or pastiche plagiarism, cut and paste, mashup, and mouse click, click plagiarism. But basically, not your own work, you're just putting little pieces together from different places. A double submission. This is serious in the sciences, in the hard sciences, and in uh, medicine, where they think because it's so expensive to get an article published for the publisher, they don't like the idea of the same uh, text being submitted to more than one journal at a time. Self-plagiarism, where you repeat works you've published in other places. Uh, again, this is a, a, a more serious uh, crime uh, or offense in the hard sciences and, and uh, medicine, but not so in the humanities. In the humanities, uh, where there are problems of linguistic uh, uh, feud, uh, uh, fiefdoms, uh, where Spanish and Portuguese, for example, are similar languages, but not the same, and sometimes in the humanities, uh, an author can publish the same uh, paper, but it's good that he cross-references and says that he's published this before, but it's not considered an offense. Collusion, especially between students without prior permission of the professor, can be considered uh, a form of plagiarism as well. Courtesy or gift authorship, where somebody who never participated in the research suddenly becomes one of the co-authors of a paper. That's considered a gift, a present, and it's it's, it's wrong, it's, it's uh, because the person did not participate. Institutional authorship, where the institution uh, gets credit, uh, although it did not sponsor either financially or contribute to the work uh, being presented. It's also called bureaucratic. Salami slicing, dividing up the results of the same research in different publications, making it difficult for researchers who follow to discover what was actually done. They have to put it together from different places. Metaplagiarism, which is one of the delightful things I've discovered. There are a good number of historical cases. Plagiarism of plagiarism. Uh, I wish I could talk about that more, but we can't. Uh, cryptomnesia, false memories, confusion of sources. You don't remember where you got that source, but you, the idea, or maybe the words, and you put it in. We call that unconscious plagiarism, too. It's, it's not too much of an offense. It's just slightly. And finally, the, the, less, the le least serious one, what we call soft plagiarism, Journalism, which is not in the academic world, but uh, as far as I know, but in the journalism world, where the journalist depends entirely for his content on press releases from other places. He doesn't write anything. He just uh, uh, mashes up a press releases. And finally, honest mistakes uh, done by students who are not fully involved in the, uh, the, the rules about plagiarism in referencing the use of quote marks, unintentional errors. And I remind you, plagiarism can occur not only in the text, but also in footnotes and bibliographies. Is there more plagiarism in higher education since the internet? Well, the literature really is not conclusive. Most claims of a significant increase are based on studies which depend on self-reporting data from the students. Now, students, you know, are normal human beings. Uh, they are not necessarily prone to uh, con convicting themselves, admitting uh, to having uh, cheated on exam. So the literature is not uh, conclusive on this, and it's not entirely reliable. We the literature also says we need more exigent, more rigorous studies. Uh, they are required in order to decide this issue. There's a characteristic failure uh, among professors and institutions to report places of plagiar cases of plagiarism. For example, professors fear to report plagiarism where they might appear to be ineffective as teachers. Professors fear not having the support of the department chairman or higher institutional authorities. And finally, professors fear that the institution will hide the fact that there was plagiarism, either individual or especially if the whole class uh, does it uh, because it, has, it means bad public relations in society. But in a study of 386 doctoral dissertations, dissertations written between 2009 and 2013, and the references in my bibliography here, in programs that are doctoral programs online and face-to-face -face using Turnitin, the conclusion was there is no significant statistical difference in occurrence of plagiarism in dissertations online and face-to-face -face programs. That was a rigorous uh, job of research and uh, reliable, I believe. What are the factors that encourage plagiarism today with the internet all over the place? Major, the major factor, I would say, is not technological. It's a paradigm change caused by postmodernism. Uh, Leo uh, Leotard, one of the 
celebrated authors in his book, The Postmodern Condition, says, we are at the end of a grand, single, overreaching, overreaching narrative. We ha need to have an assault on norms. We need normlessness or moral deregulation because we have the power to defy norms and to determine the veracity of competing claims. All truth and morality are relative. Relativism. So it's not such a crime to plagi uh, plagiarize this. It's you know, minor and so forth. Truth is not found but made, the postmodernists say. And another author, Seth Godin, says, one cannot write without using the ideas, the metaphors, the styles, the tropes, the processes, the concepts, and examples with successes that came before. Another factor, essay mills existing on the internet, uh, contract ghostwriting for academic purposes. And the delightful thing is, in their advertising, these commercial essay mills say, ah, you can get from us uh, texts that are plagiarism free. When they are what that when what they are selling is full of plagiarism. It, it, it's a plagiaristic act, let's say. Uh, also available on the internet for free now are paraphrasing tools, uh, which are rich in synonyms. That'll take a text that you send them. The software will take out uh, certain adjectives and nouns and so forth, change them for other words, and create a new text, which makes it difficult for. A, a plagiarism detection software to discover the, the fact. What are the techniques for identifying online plagiarism? That is, what should the professor look for when uh, when he senses that a text might be plagiarized? An extreme change in writing style within the document. A noticeable change of type fonts, type size, type color. Identifying uncommon <laughs> phrases or keywords which the student, let's say a first year student in the university, it's quite unlikely that he will use them. That might raise a suspicion. Beware of non-native speakers, international students, who suddenly are blooming in excellent prose in the text that they In Australia, they have an especially great problem. They have a great number of foreign students, and suddenly they're, they're, there's a lot of plagiarism going on there, and they publish a lot of research on plagiarism with foreign students coming out of Australia. Turnitin is now promising for 2018 a new software instrument called Authorship Investigation, which is based on machine learning and forensic linguistic best practices, and it's designed to be personalized for each student. Why personalized, and what do I mean? Well, one of the methods that I would suggest for combating plagiarism at the beginning of every course, ask your students to send you a sample of their earlier work in digital form, a five-page minimum, I would say. Why? For later verification of the writing style. They handed you one thing at the beginning of the course. Let's see if what they hand you at the end of the course is done in the same style. If not, it, it, it raises suspicion. Advise the students of the rules concerning plagiarism and its non-acceptability. Students should confirm in writing their understanding and agreement with the terms. Professors should become familiar with websites that sell papers and automated editing services and let the students know that you know about these services. That will frighten them a little bit, which is good. Assignments should require original thinking and going beyond the first page of a Google search. Consider using the Plagiarism Knowledge Survey, which is a, a short quiz that's on the internet free, one you can download it, it's in the bibliography, on the web as reinforcement of what you have already taught your students about uh, plagiarism. Combating plagiarism, and throughout every course, require more than one written assignment. And then each of these assignments be submitted with the following declaration. I know the rules about plagiarism, and this is my own work, followed by a signature. Then that, that uh, makes it very uh, potent for the professor or the institution to punish the student if it's been a serious case, a hard case of plagiarism. Or you can develop an honor code for all students and teaching staff to follow with regard to academic work detailing the obligations of academic integrity. The honor code is not a popular thing, not even in American universities. There's only about 100 uh, which have them. I have another t talk uh, which I give about honor codes. I'm very much in favor of them. And there's reasonably good uh, evidence that they are uh, successful in their mission. Is plagiarism detection software a solution with no drawbacks? Plagiarism detection is not a magic bullet. It requires other things in the environment to reduce plagiarism. Online detection services should only serve as a mere diagnostic tool to highlight possible cases of plagiarism with human judgment always needed to investigate further. Now, in the coming years, we're going to be uh, encountering another problem, the rise of the visual internet. 
where what, what we're witnessing, according to the literature, is the decline of the importance of text and the rise in the power of audio and video, of podcasts, of memes, of talking assistants. And it's going to be very difficult to accompany this to discover a plagiarism. Google image search will be used more and more by all of us. Uh, okay. Do interventions finally like ethics training really work? A study in 2016 led by Anna Maruzic of the University of Split in Croatia, I'm pleased to say, and Elizabeth Wager, a celebrated lady from the United Kingdom, uh, the leader of COPE, uh, an organization uh, devoted to uh, integrity in academic work. This study found little good evidence that it does. It was a meta-analysis of 31 studies, 15 randomized controlled trials with 9,500 participants. What was the focus? To discover since uh, with uh, ethics training what came afterward in the knowledge, the attitudes, and the behavior, plagiarizing or no plagiarizing, with regard to plagiarism by these 9,500 participants. Training indeed had some effects on attitudes, but minimal effect or short-lived effect on their knowledge of plagiarism. The evidence the re researchers reported was in general of very low quality. The studies used different measures of success, so it was difficult to compare, and were not well designed to reduce bias in the questions that were asked. Few details were given about the number of sessions that were held in the training, the length of the training, or the curriculum of the training, and so it was impossible to repeat or adopt this research. Of all areas of integrity, Luckily, plagiarism fared the best, perhaps because it's more technical or because software detection is easier to quantify. They didn't know what caused it. Here's my bibliography. I invite everybody to come to the next International Congress on Distance Education here in Brazil. It'll be in early October of this year. You're all welcome. We usually have more than 2,000 people attending, and we have a lot of fun with dinner dances and so forth. Thanks for your kind attention. I hope I've raised some doubts. That's it. Thank you, Professor Rita. A very, very good uh, presentation, emphasizing the, the all possibilities of plagiarism. I wasn't aware of all of them. Uh, there are really quite a, a, a few uh, of them. We started some discussion here uh, in, in the chat. Um, maybe uh, I open the, the, the floor for some questions in the chat, if there are. Uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, turn it in uh, like a, a software uh, uh, for uh, prevention of plagiarism. But actually, um, uh, will this software uh, prevent or detect the plagiarism? Uh, because it's different if we want to uh, get someone uh, doing it or we want to prevent uh, students to think about it even. And I'm sorry to hear that from these uh, studies that there is a low uh, uh, improvement uh, regarding the, the uh, education about uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, plagiarism as something wrong. Uh, what would you say would be the best, uh, maybe not best, but possible solution to make students more aware that this is wrong? Can you hear me? Uh, uh. Can you hear me? I, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Uh, I think the things that I've listed there, uh, the training is important, but it has to be done. Okay. The, the training, although we don't have good information uh, about what is the best. The research that has been published is not conclusive. It's, uh, training is necessary. I mean, it, it, even, uh, even if it's weakly done, if it's, if it's not excellent, but it's good, it's still important. But I think after the training, the professor of a course has to use certain techniques to uh, close down as much as possible the possibility of, of plagiarism. First, letting the students know that he will, he or she will be aware uh, that these, these, the, the software detection, 
What before software, how did a professor know or suspect plagiarism? He knew the literature in the field. He could detect plagiarism with his own individual knowledge. But now, with the, the avalanche of published information, production of doctoral theses and so forth, it's, it's almost impossible for an individual professor to know the literature intimately enough to be able to uh, feel a red light going off in his mind when he reads a student paper. Uh, so you have to ask the student to give you uh, an earlier example of the work and then compare it in style, and there will be software to help you compare this from here on in, uh, to see if what he hands in here and now uh, is, is similar to what it was three years ago, six months ago, and so forth. Uh, we, we cannot eliminate training. Training has to go on. It has to be repeated. It has to be done in high school. It has to be done at the beginning of college and in every course. Uh, every course syllabus distributed to the students should not only have the program of the course, what's going to be studied, but the warning about uh, the avoidance of plagiarism. I, I think that's about it uh, in response to your question. Okay, we have here in the chat uh, one question regarding cultural differences. Uh, is uh, cultural difference influencing uh, the different uh, uh, idea of what is the plagiarism? So how, how to deal with that? Um, perhaps what's uh, something, uh, uh, what's wrong in Croatia, maybe it's not wrong in Japan. So uh, how, how to uh, deal with that? How, what are the experience? Do you know something about that? Yeah, may I, may I address that point you've just made? Uh, I did not put into my talk uh, my, my sentiments of five or six years of, of intensive research about pl academic plagiarism. I'm convinced that the rules about plagiarism, but more importantly, the punishment given, that is what is considered plagiarism, what is not considered plagiarism, differs from country to country based on its academic traditions and its culture. It, it differs from university to university, from professional uh, a council, you know, uh, medicine, uh, biology, uh, uh, humanistic studies, and so forth. It depends on the department. It depends on the prestige or no prestige, the political situation of the professor in the department. If he or she is in tune with the thinking of the department, he or she is protected if he or she plagiarizes. And if he or she accuses a student of plagiarism, if the professor doing the accusing is in tune with the political culture of the department, the department will support the professor. If he or she is not in tune, sorry, the professor is, is playing with danger. It really depends on, on environmental culture, academic culture. Yeah. And maybe just one more uh, question or comment that we, we have to think about the, the role of the assessment uh, uh, design can play in reducing plagiarism. So if we reduce the opportunities for students to plagiarize through assessment design, like reflective exercises in our portfolio, it can also contribute to reducing plagiarism. Do you agree with that? Your voice was cut off. Uh, sorry. So the last question was, uh, we think to uh, think about role of assessment design. You can look at the uh, presenter area. Can you can you see this? Uh, Laura uh, Costelloa asked uh, about a uh, role of assessment design in uh, reducing plagiarism. What is your opinion about that? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Okay. Um, no, I, I, I can't hear. No, I didn't hear the question. Okay. Uh, I, uh, please look at the questions here in uh, the presenter area, so you can maybe through chat answer to some of, of them. And now we will move on to the, to the next presentation. Okay, 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lito. And now we are going to uh, Dr. Irene Glendinning, um, Academic Manager for Student Experience at the University of Office of Teaching and Learning at the Coventry University. Uh, Irene has been working in higher education for 27 years, uh, uh, taking lots of positions there, so she has quite valuable experience uh, in this field. But maybe to emphasize that she uh, was principal investigator and project manager for the Erasmus funded project, Impact of Policies for Plagiarism in Higher Education Across Europe, which will uh, she give some uh, results uh, today about it. Uh, topic, uh, title of her presentation is Academic Integrity in Distance Learning Programs, Securing Authentication and Verifying Authenticity, authenticity of Assessment. So, Irene, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I'm hearing anything from that. Right, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak to you. Um, I, I haven't been to Zagreb, but I do love Croatia. I've been to lots of parts of Croatia and lots of parts of former Yugoslavia. And I'm going to slip, slip from that slide. What I'm going to try to do is I'll give you a, a summary of my recent research, but I'm going to skip over that very quickly because I'll look at that in more depth as we go through the bits that are relevant. Most of my research has not been into distance learning, but I think a lot of the things that, that we found in general, higher education apply to distance learning, and some of them are even more so. Um, and so I'm going to actually focus on the results that we've had more recently than the IFI project. We did um, a project in, in Southeastern Europe, actually in the, in the Balkans region. And so those results are actually of direct relevance to Zagreb and, and perhaps other people who are listening. Uh, and I'm going to try to apply some of those findings to distance and, and, uh, and online and learning. Uh, and then and then some recommendations at the end. And because time is short, I might skip some of the the, um, the slides and not do them in, in so much detail. So I'm not going to go through all of that, but if you want to have a look at that, I've been involved in lots of different types of work. And my most recent research that I'm involved in is a, is a global study, for, and it's actually looking at the role of quality assurance agencies and accreditation bodies in, in tackling academic corruption. And that's a really interesting study that I'm doing. Um, but I'm, I'm also involved, I'm still involved in the area of kind of plagiarism and, and contract cheating and so on. There are lots of things I've, I've been involved in. And particularly, I was part of the organising group for the International Day of Action on contract cheating, which happens in October of the last two years, and hopefully we'll run it again in, this year. So I wanted to start off by giving my definition of academic integrity as opposed to plagiarism. And I think what I'm talking about when I talk about academic integrity, also the terms that are used can be research integrity, education integrity, or just plain integrity. I'm talking about practice. I didn't get the highlight quite right there. Practice, ethos, culture, strategy, values, and policy. And it also occurs on an individual basis. It applies to everybody. But it, we can think about these things as being institutional, national, international. So it's, it's, it's important that we establish that. Clearly it's the converse of academic malpractice. And I like the International Centre of Academic Integrity's six words for describing integrity. Honesty, trust, responsibility, respect, fairness, transparency. And you'll see me using some of these terms, but also the courage to act on your, on your values and to defend your, your, your rights and your, and your values. And, and I do like this, I have no idea who said this, but I do like this expression. Whether you have integrity or not, perhaps you can measure that by how you behave, and that applies institutionally as well as individually, how you behave when nobody's watching you. So the challenges to authentic assessment that particularly apply to online distance education, clearly plagiarism is, is a big one, and it is still the biggest one. But as, as we heard from Frederick, um, there are different types of plagiarism, and there is hard plagiarism, and soft plagiarism, and so on. Completely agree with everything he said. Um, it, it was, it's actually a very good introduction to what I'm going to present, and you'll see some overlaps as well with what I've got to say. Inappropriate collusion, we talked about too. Contract cheating, I'm going to talk about a little bit more 
It doesn't need to be highlighted there because it is a big problem. Self plagiarism that Frederick mentioned. Exam cheating is a big problem. It's a big problem that we found in particularly in parts of Europe. Impersonation is a problem, particularly for uh, distance learning. So how do you know it's the person that you think it is who's doing the work? Um, and that, that applies if you're doing um, if you're doing examinations remotely that, that are not um, controlled in any way. Certainly, the data fabrication, manipulation, selectivity, and all the things to do with research and how and how research can be corrupted in different ways. Bribery, I'm going to talk to you about more in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but also things like coercion and bullying. To accept um, things like um, the, the lecturer insisting that the student has to buy a textbook that they have written from them, um, otherwise they won't pass, things like that we can cross. Um, but also aiding other people to be dishonest. We do come across students who, who are working as contract cheating mini companies uh, who are supplying information to other students. So there's lots of things there. So the highlighted ones are the things I'm, I'm, that, that, I, that we identified as being problematic, particularly within the South, Southeast European region. I'm going to start by just defining what I mean by contract cheating. And, and this is defined in, in a document from the Quality Assurance Agency in the UK that came out in, um, in October 2017. So what we're talking about contract cheating is not just about, about paper mills or essay mills. Or, it's also about ghostwriting by different people. So they might be family friends, they might be um, colleagues at university, they might be older students within the same institution. But clearly it's a big problem um, because there are a lot of these contract cheating companies that are really profitable commercial organisations. And it, it's not easy to keep track of them. So the research that's been done in Australia and in the UK by various people has identified over a thousand of these companies. And they're global, they're, 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 they're everywhere. Um, and, and if you get rid of them in one country, they'll pop up somewhere else. So they are very, very difficult. But there are lots of things on that slide that I haven't got time to go into, but they will, it's not just about essays, it's about lots of other things as well. They will also, these companies will also provide um, a, a kind of cradle to grave service for a student where they can do all the assessment work for them throughout their, their, um, their career as a student, including um, impersonation to sit an exam and so on. And, and they will also produce drafts of work so that if, if, you, if the student needs to show that they're making progress, they can do that as well. And it all depends on how much you, you, you prepare to pay for it. So it's a big, complicated, but it's also a very serious threat to the integrity of higher education. So I'd like to spend a bit more time on that slide, but I'm going to have to move on, otherwise I'm going to run out of time with the other things I want to say. The project that, that um, I was involved in last year, 16-17, uh, uh, with Mendel University in Brno, who worked on the earlier project that I led, um, was funded by the Council of Europe. Now, this what this project did was it, it extended the research that we did on the 27 European Union countries. In that case, it didn't involve Croatia, um, and it brought in six more countries. And I'll show you those countries in a minute. But basically, former Yugoslavian countries in that area plus Albania. Um, and so, what we did was we slightly modified the survey that we did for the first project. Um, but not so much that we couldn't compare the earlier results to the later results. So, um, and we also had it in the local languages as well. And it's worth saying at this point that the Council of Europe is extending the research that we did on the original EP project and they're providing funding so that eventually we will have surveyed 50 countries. So that, that covers all the Council of Europe countries. And and we're involved in the next leg of those of those, those that research, probably for about September this year. So these are the countries that we that we surveyed um, a year ago, we finished about a year ago, um, and that was quite interesting findings. So I'll tell you a little bit about that now. Certainly, it's not a secret that the um, corruption in in, in the um, in the Balkans region is quite high. Croatia has has the lowest of, of the of the six countries that we looked at, and that's 57 in the 2017 um, Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International. 
Um, but on this, on this latest one, which I only discovered yesterday, I was using an older version of it, Macedonia is really down in the 107th position out of the 180 countries surveyed. So there is a culture of corruption in the region, which actually does impact on higher education as well, which you'll hear in, in, on the next slide. The universities um, tend to be very large. The, they, they don't function very much as, as institutions because the faculties are quite autonomous. So it's very uncommon to have institutional policies within the area, and that's one of the one of the factors that we see as being important in, in, in tackling uh, uh, corruption and, and malpractice. There are very big differences between universities in the region, and there are some really uh, good examples as well as some poor examples of malpractice. But what we found is generally a very relaxed attitude to quite serious forms of cheating. And, but there was awareness um, and openness and willingness to discuss the problems in most of the institutions and, and um, interviews that we did, but not everywhere. And some, there was a little bit of a, um, kind of ostrich mentality kind of head in the sand in some areas, particularly where, where perhaps the senior management were not aware of any problems with the students from the same institution telling us about them. So here, here is some evidence that's quite important. And most of this applies to the kind of distance learning online learning situation. There is a perception that corruption in society makes it difficult. So the fact that, that there is a high level of corruption in society, people think that, that, that there is no opportunity for changing things in education, which is very sad. Because actually, uh, there, is, there are lots of, um, well, they need to do something about it. Uh, ghost writing, essay mills, but all of those things were very common in, in the area. And they were in other parts of Europe in the earlier survey, but they were, they were particularly uh, dominant within within the region that we surveyed last year. Um, there was, the, the students and the staff were telling us in many institutions that there is a lot of rote learning um, and the students were particularly upset that their, their, their own opinions and their, their critical thinking was not necessarily valued by professors. They just wanted them to repeat stuff they've been told. And, and that really, in that context, it's very difficult to separate out plagiarism. Because if you're just expected to repeat stuff you've been told, then plagiarism is okay. And, and yeah, I think we all know that it isn't. Um, there were major problems with exam cheating, and, and a lot of it was just to, to do with lax invigilation. The students knew which lecturers didn't really care, and, and they knew that they could, could misbehave in, 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 in formal exams when certain lecturers were, were uh, supervising. There were a lot of repeat assessments, so the work had, had been shown around several times and there were lots of standard solutions out there and, and certain exam questions as well that the students could draw on. So they weren't really being challenged by the assessment, that's what we were being told. Worryingly, we were told that, that some professors were taking bribes from students to change marks and to influence their results. And that's really quite, quite, quite concerning. So yeah, they, they, these are bordering... Uh, Malpractice bordering on corruption, I would say, and I would certainly bribery, I would put under, under the banner of corruption. But on the positive side, almost all the people we talked to, and we talked to managers, we talked to students, and we talked to, to professors, teachers, tutors, almost all of them said they wanted more training and guidance. And I was very interested in, in, in Frederick's um, take on that and, and his, his information about that. Certainly, Sustained training is very, very important in my opinion, and it's no good doing it just once, it just won't work. Um, there were lots of examples of the practice that I've said before, and a very keen interest by most uh, to improve and, and, and to, um, to make a difference. So this probably won't mean a huge amount to you in, in that context, but basically on the earlier research that I um, was involved in, that I led, I created a, a tool called the Academic Integrity Maturity Model, and it, it, it used the survey results to, to create some metrics. Um, so on, on the basis of nine measurements, we were able to compare the results for different countries based on the, um, on, on the, on the answers to the questions from, from the different levels of survey that we did. And those are the six ones. So you can see um, Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia, it's third, um, 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 former Yugoslavian um, country of Macedonia, 
uh, Montenegro and, um, and, and Serbia are the countries in that order in, in there. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide, which gives the same information in a slightly different format, so using a radar chart. So there you can see the strengths and weaknesses. So the point of this, of this measurement is not to judge as much as say, these are areas that you need to focus on where we've identified weaknesses. And there is a SWOT analysis for each country in the report that's, that's now being published by the Council of Europe. So those are the 33 countries surveyed in order in terms of the academic integrity maturity model results. And you'll see round about the middle, we've got, uh, we've got Bosnia Herzegovina just on the positive side, um, Macedonia, Croatia, and so on. So the, the Balkans region doesn't stand apart from the rest of Europe. It actually integrates quite well in, in terms of, of, of how they stand. The score, the maximum score, incidentally, on the, on the vertical scale is 36. So even the UK, that had quite a high score, um, has got a long way to go before it could be considered excellence. There's, there's a lot more improvement there needed in, um, in most of those categories. And I believe you'll have access to these slides if you want to look at that in more detail. We have used the survey in, in, in countries outside Europe as well. And I've also used the survey uh, to, to assess in individual institutions, um, which is quite interesting. So in terms of the online distance learning, and I know I'm running out of time, so I need to be very quick on the last few slides. Um, clearly, one of the problems is identifying, identifying the students. If they're not on campus and if the assessments are not controlled, but also making sure that distance learning students have this education about or the training they need about academic integrity, um, creating assessments that, that challenge but also accurately measure learning and achievements and, and don't just measure the, you know, what the students have learned by rote, um, how to control the assessment process. And of course, I've got more questions here than answers for you. I'm hoping in Chris's talk that's coming up soon, we'll have some more of the answers. Um, ensuring that students are doing the assessments themselves. Um, but most importantly, at the bottom, it's also about the, the tutors. And it's about how tutors approach the students and their consistency of approach. Um, and certainly what we found is that there's quite a lot of autonomy in terms of um, the, way students, the way tutors are allowed to penalise students and so on. Um, based on my uh, current research that I'm doing um, with CHIA, the CHIA International Quality Group, the oversight and quality assurance is actually very, very important to ensure that um, things are sound, but also not in just in terms of the students, but also in terms of the, of the way the marking is taking place, the way the, the professors and the tutors are, are, are behaving towards the students. Um, and uh, I know it's not the norm in every country, but certainly a combination of strong internal and strong external um, examining and, and oversight can help with, with all of these, these things. So in terms of the institution, there should be an institution-wide strategy with consistent, consistently applied policies and procedures for both discouraging misconduct but also handling accusations making decisions on this conduct, particularly sanctions, proportional and fair sanctions and penalties, um, and making sure that those are applied consistently and fairly to the students, um, maintaining records of misconduct and, and the outcomes of those cases is also quite important. And, and I think quite often that's not done because it's done on a very local level. And in that way, you can, you can have a, a measure of, of whether you're making an impact on this. Um, again, I've said consistency from our state attitudes is very important. And it's quite difficult to know how much academic misconduct you've not detected or not penalised. Um, but also you need to bear in mind the, the integrity of academic staff in all of this to make sure they are, are behaving in, in an appropriate way towards the students. Because if they're not setting a good example, then uh, the students, um, you can't expect the students to, to behave. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, but clearly the teaching, learning and assessment these methods are really very important, and I have mentioned some of these before, and there are different ways that can be done. But I'm just going to briefly mention 
extracurricular activities. And I mentioned earlier on the International Day of Action that we've held in the last two years um, in conjunction with the International Centre for Academic Integrity. It's a great day and we get students to in involve themselves and if possible make it as much as we can student-led. So that's what that sign's all about. So if you haven't been involved in that process before, hopefully you'll sign yourself up um, for the 2018 uh, version of that, which hopefully will be in October coming up. Um, so these are some, some things I, I want to kind of emphasise. Am I okay to go on, Sandra? Am I, I'm overrunning, I know. Yeah, you're a little bit running of time, but uh, if you can summarise okay. in two minutes, uh, maybe. It's important that, that students are seen as allies, not as our enemies, because the, the honest students are as keen to have um, my practice stamped out as, as the... Um, as the um, management of the university as well. Um, the education, uh, both the tutors and the students, um, whistleblowing policy is quite important. So if anyone wants to report to malpractice, they, they can do it in, in safety and provide opportunities for formative learning and so on. I said all those things earlier on. Um, there are very serious consequences if, if it's not addressed, not least the institutional reputation. I'll leave you to leave that, leave that slide in, in your own time. But there are some global recommendations here which I'll leave you with. And there are, there are lots of references on the slides that I won't show you that are coming up later, um, including, um, which, which Frederick mentioned uh, briefly as well, establishing a common understanding of acceptable uh, and academic practice, um, because there are differences of opinion right across the world, um, but also make sure that quality assurance and accreditation bodies know what their role is to help with this process. There are, there's also legal uh, issues that, that, that can be brought to bear, particularly on contract cheating, and some countries have already done that, so we're working on that with the UK at the moment. Um, but the very last point I will point out here, um, certainly I agree with, with uh, Frederick that we need to start much earlier on. It's, it's not something just for higher education, it's something we need to start right from the beginning. So thank you very much for listening. And those are some of my references. There are a couple of pages of those. There are so many of them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Irene. Uh, a very good presentation, and I, I, uh, I'm gladly, glad that I was able to see the results of this uh, project which was done in uh, uh, former Yugoslavian countries. Um, maybe to come back to, to one of two issues you have mentioned, um, is uh, uh, academic integrity issue which is dealt between teacher and student or, or, or should it go to the high level to the institution or the ministry on the national level? So can a teacher uh, by itself uh, give some uh, regulations about it or it should be much more wider on a high level? Uh, so uh, what do you think? That's a very, very good question. And most um, most institutions will tend to have a panel um, that, that is that will function either at the faculty level or at the institutional level. My institution doesn't have, and, and there are a few institutions in the UK that don't have that. We have what we call academic integrity officers and or academic conduct officers, um, and they are they are trained people. It's part of my role to train train the staff. Um, they are trained to have an interview with the students and to, and to deal with the, the issue, but they are working on a very strict basis um, and, and uh, the outcomes from their decisions are communicated directly to the student, but they are monitored and moderated um, and centrally so that we have a consistency right across the whole institution. So we devolve our, um, our decisions for, for many of the, uh, the, the, the accusations of misconduct to these academic conduct officers. But we also have panels. So where we have, where we have very serious cases or repeat offences, um, the student will not be seen by an academic conduct officer, uh, but, but will, be, will go to a panel, and the panel consists of a number of academic conduct officers, and it will be dealt with there. And in this way, we have a consistent approach, a fair approach, that's devolved. The, the value of having academic conduct officers who are trained is that their role is not just to penalise, it's to support the student and to try to correct the behaviour. 
and um, it will vary between different institutions. So, for example, in um, in Sweden, they have a, um, a a kind of institutional level uh, panel uh, that's, that used to be chaired by the vice chancellor, and it will have people like judges on the panel, and, and that is quite a scary thing for a student to go through because a student has made a mistake, they need to be corrected. That won't always work, but uh, they need to be given a, a, the opportunity to, to make good work done. Um, it should not, in my opinion, um, it should not be dealt with by an individual tutor because you'll end up with inconsistencies, um, you'll end up with all sorts of um, problems because it's, the, the tutor has a relationship with the student that is about educating the student. Therefore, the, the tutor should not be the person who deals with the misconduct. Tutor might present the case, but will not make the decision on the penalty. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you for this good advice. And just uh, one last question, looking at the panel and uh, at the questions and comments uh, that the uh, participants have provided. We were focusing very much on the students, but what about academic staff and plagiarism? Who is, uh, because the academic staff are not only teachers, they are also researchers and they are producing papers, and who is uh, looking uh, upon them, how to deal with Well, in terms, of, sorry, in terms of my own institution, it's quite a separate process of business conduct for the staff, because staff can also be students as well. Um, but there is quite a different process, and it's a disciplinary issue if the staff is, is found to have uh, any uh, issues that, that need to be um, answered. So they go through the staff disciplinary process rather than through the same procedure as the students. Okay, thank you, Irene, very much for your presentation. And now we will move uh, to the last uh, presentation and last presenter, uh, Chris. Chris works at the Open University UK. He's a lecturer there, and he chairs the master module Openness and Innovation e-learning. Uh, and also he's researcher on the project Tesla, so he will say something about that uh, in his today's presentation, uh, but also he will say something about how Open University UK is dealing with this issue. So, Chris, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandra, and, and thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a real pleasure to, to be here and to be able to speak with you and to, to get some uh, questions and hopefully some new ideas as well that I, I can pick up on. Um, I'd, I've been working at the university, the Open University, for um, over 22 years now, and that's always a shock when I think about that. But um, and there's been a lot of change over that time, and we we developed in the way in which we we teach students and help them learn, and and in the way in which we we think about curriculum. So. I'm going to just talk about some aspects of this over over to the session today, and um, I'm just seeing how I can. Oh, I thought I'd be able to. Can you, you tell me how I need? Oh, I know. Sorry, I've got it. So, the contents of this uh, presentation, I, I try to keep it quite tight. Um, and to talk about, first of all, some aspects of our teaching model that, that we've used and that we've developed. And then to look a bit about authentication, about what we do currently and about some aspects of um, that are developing in e-authentication. And that's where the Tesla project comes in. And lastly, just to look at some other possibilities that are for ways of, of helping support academic integrity. And so... If I just move on again, I've titled this um, you, know, you Teach Your Model um, and added communication to that because there's obviously lots of ways in which we can, we can think of our, our model of teaching and there's lots of representations of it. Um, and one, one of the things that are, are particularly important about academic um, integrity is to do with the communication. And, and the path. So I've just drawn this uh, out and it, it helps illustrate some of the ways in which the university has changed over the years as well. So we have our, our module materials that are generally created by a team and, and 
then presented through the internet, through our virtual learning environment to, to the students and to the, the tutors or the academic and the associate lecturers that we have that do the tutoring. There's also, uh, there's always demand for students that want hard copy whenever we carry out a survey and ask the students, they, they would much rather have hard copy than have things delivered through or solely through the internet. I think a lot of them realise that um, electronic delivery through the, the internet actually allows um, a much wider variety of, of assets to be produced and opportunities for them. So I think they appreciate that. But they, they're very reluctant to give up um, paper altogether. So we, we still offer that. And I think we offer print on demand for a lot of other things. So there's that corner. Um, so the students will, will um, communicate with, with their tutor and with other students, also mostly through the internet, through the forums that we have set up within the VLE. And during that time, we, we, um, the students will start to learn about each other and the associate lecturers will start to know, learn a little about the students. Um, and the students also have the other opportunities of, of speaking by telephone, or there's also face-to-face -face opportunities that we still have, and uh, through through day schools or through workshops, um, and, and and maybe even residential schools in some subjects still. So, I think when we when we think about the fact that we are a distance learning organisation and we might have. Um, getting on for 200,000 students at any one time, that the model that we have is, is uh, a bit more complex than just dealing with or sort of providing for students an online experience. Um, so if I move on again. If we look at um, or what we do now in terms of, of authentication uh, in of student work and, and of, of what's going on. So being a large institution, we, we have some modules that have perhaps up to 10,000 students. Um, a lot don't, most don't. Um, but the approach that we have is scalable, which means that, that every tutor will, will have their own group of about 20 to 25 students. And they're the people that they uh, interact with um, and they teach and they will teach in their, their tutor uh, tutorials, and most of which will be online, but there might be some face-to-face -face ones, uh, as I mentioned. Um, and so even, it doesn't matter what size the module is in terms of cohort, that's the model, so that every student will, will relate to a tutor. And um, and so most work, when, when students are assessed, they will submit it through, through our own um, secure systems and and it be marked by that tutor that has started to get to know them and so I think picking up on, on something that Frederick said uh, uh, at the start was that one of the things you look out for is any any sort of massive changes in students work or any sudden leaps in their abilities that that they present um, but but Tutors will start to know the kind of language that students use and the kind of, from, not just from the work that they um, submit, but from the way in which they speak in the forums in which they, they communicate with other students. So there's that aspect of it. Um, the, the electronic system for managing the work is, is something that students have to log on to. Um, that, that it is, in theory, it's only they that can do that, but of course, all these things could be open to, to abuse. Um, and last of all, that we, we have um, submitting work to, to turn it in, which we do routinely, and we have our own anti-collusion system, which we call Copy Catch. And so both of those um, systems are diagnostic in that they, they flag um, quite a lot more <laughs> um, possibilities that, for, for plagiarism that, that we have to then look at and, and filter through and make individual decisions about. And, and as, as we've heard before, that, that these are tools that are diagnostic. They don't make the decision on our behalf. Um, and, and every module will have uh, someone who's allocated to, to look at each assessment as it's handed in and make their own uh, judgment uh, in terms of reviewing that data. And then if, if um, any piece of work seems to be um, plagiarism, 
uh, either deliberate or, or, or accidental, then, then it will be dealt with through the university systems and, uh, and, and the, the right action taken. Mostly, I should say, in the, the module that I run, I find that the tools tend to pick up um, a poor practice, poor academic practice, in which students will tend to um, quote uh, another piece of work and they will then cite that piece of work as we'd expect in um, but they wouldn't necessarily use quotations. So when when the software looks through, it would it would pick up the quotation and see that it wasn't quoted in the correct way, and, and flag that. So if most of it is to do with academic practice, then that's something that that we can deal with with students on an individual basis and help them improve. Uh, obviously, if that's repeated, then then we have to then think about some some other action. So that's essentially what we, we do now. And um, what we might be doing in the near future, or what we have the opportunity to do, is um, is pick up on a lot more of the, the, the tools that have been developed uh, all, all around the world by all sorts of groups. And there's multiple versions of, of lots of these tools. But for the last year or so, I've been working um, uh, with a team in our university uh, as a, one of the partners in the Tesla project. Uh, and the Tesla is essentially trialing five different tools. And I've listed them there. There's an anti-plagiarism tool, which actually, when you look at it, is much more of an anti-collusion tool um, in the way in which it works. Um, there's also a facial recognition tool, uh, which does just that. Um, it uses a webcam to confirm that we have the right person sitting in front of the computer. So it might not be recording them in a sense that, that they might not be recording their assessment or their interaction. It could just be used to just check that that's the student that's sitting at the computer doing the typing or, or producing something else or working through an activity. Um, face, uh, forensic analysis um, is, is another tool we, we've been is, we're trialing within this project, and that looks at the kind of style that a student uses in their writing. And I think it it, it sounds um, like it might be similar to, to the to the work that um, Turnitin are, are producing in their new tool, tools that they're going to be offering later this year. Um, but it, as far as we're concerned, it's, it tends to be a black box that, that students' work is, is put through. And um, like most of these tools, it needs to be um, seeded, if you like, or, or primed with some authenticated data from the student. And so the facial recognition tool needs to have a reference set of images of that student so then it can compare all the subsequent um, uh, times instances against that reference set and it will give um, a value uh, or return a value to, to the um, student. We could we could have it going to the student but also to, to the academic that, that's involved in the tutor, um, which would then give some indication of the, the confidence that, that we have or the tools have that that's actually the right student. So just going on with the other tools, the keystroke dynamics tool actually checks in real time um, so a student would have to not be typing in Word, um, but they'd have to be typing in the web interface, which can present its own, own issues. But, but if, if a student is typing an answer to something or doing some writing, some drafting, then, then they will type it into, into the, the, the web browser interface. And what was going on there is, again, a reference set of their typing will be made at the start of their studies. And this particular instance of typing will be checked against that. And it's looking at the rhythm of typing, looking at how keys are pressed uh, in conjunction with other keys. So it's not bothered about what words um, are actually written. It could be nonsense, but it's the way in which the keyboard is used. And so that, again, would return a, a, a value of confidence. And last of all, there's the, the voice recognition tool, which, like the facial recognition tool, will make a recording, although this time just a voice recording of a, the student. In fact, it has several um, instances of, of voice recordings that are set up at the start, and then those are compared to any later instance. 
So the idea is that these tools could be, be used um, on their own or in uh, conjunction with one another, for, depending on, on the work that the student's doing and the importance and the value of, of that work. And the, the idea as well that this is all transparent. So the, the last thing that um, the tools are set up to do is, is to, to make the students feel spied on <laughs> you can see that this is a real risk and it's um i think with with the the way in which we we read the media and the accounts that we we see um, on the television that we i think feel a natural skepticism to to having allowing these tools to to work even in the background but um if if students uh, completely understand why these are used and if they completely trust the institution that's using them and understand where the data is going and they know that they can turn them off or when, when they need to then or they can they activate them for a particular piece of work then that that becomes something that that might enable them to feel that they um they're not actually just being spied on all the time and it would allow um, the institution maybe to, to look at different kinds of assessment that could be used that they, they've been reluctant to use till now because they have a, a higher degree of confidence that they they can be assured that it is the students work that is being presented so that's a brief run through those tools um, there is an issue that i think we're finding um, that's kind of fundamental to these and and that's for the reference sets you need to properly authenticate the reference set and you, you, if you just trust that the students setting up their own reference set, then at a, at a distance, then you're obviously going to be checking against that for if, for all this the future study. And so, if you're not absolutely sure that that set belongs to that student, um, you you can't be absolutely sure that you've got the right students subsequently. And so I think that would present issues for us in how, how do you establish the authentication of those initial data sets, those reference data sets. Um, obviously, at a face-to-face -face institution, you can have your students run through these, perhaps over a few days at the beginning of their study, and then say, OK, now we can, we don't have to have all your assessments handed in on paper, but we can allow you to do your, your assessments or a lot of your assessments in a variety of different ways over the internet in different locations, and we can be sure, or fairly sure, sure enough that, that it's you that's doing it. So. Um, so that's what's going on there. I've put the, the URL for the Tesla Projects um, page on, on that slide and you can look and there's a video there, but it, it runs for two and, a, two and a quarter minutes roughly, which um, would, I won't show it now because it would take up a huge chunk of this, this presentation. But, but do have a look at it and uh, it will list all the 18 partners as well that are involved in that, that project. So if I just move on to the next slide, which um, I wanted to, to highlight a couple of other tools that have been developed that um, perhaps not quite so directly related to academic integrity, but, uh, but I think you'll see that they are as I talk them through. And um, one of them is called, called Open Essayist, and it's, um, it's a tool that's been divide, um, designed in, uh, in collaboration with, 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 with Oxford and with, with others. Um, and the idea of that is that it, it analyzes students' writing and gives a report back, a partial graphical display, but also um, an analysis so on, on, on written or no work, um, comparing, that, showing, giving them an illustration of the quality of, of their writing. And it's best if I just show you the image of that in a minute, but, but there is, um, uh, the, one of the papers, one of the most recent papers available is, is uh, written there, so you can follow up on that. And the other um, development is called Open Mentor, and that is actually to give feedback on tutors' feedback. So, um, so this perhaps is, is um, uh, the least closely related to, to academic in, integrity in the sense that we're, we're or, or authentication, but it does it does lead into to the kind of best practice in terms of, of feedback that, that 
that we, we can offer students. And both of those tools um, uh, are developed to a point where they, they can be used. I think as an institution, we have yet to make the decision that we're going to resource to use those more widely, although I would really like that. I've used them both in the module that I run and uh, particularly with Open Essayist, Open Essays, sorry, I was um, really encouraged to see how students, when when they first used it, they, they found they met it with some degree of scepticism. How can this tool possibly tell me something useful about my writing? And, and then by the time they used it once or twice on their, their assignments, they began to see, well, actually, it does offer something. And, it, and it, it's um, they, they became quite willing to just submit their work to this and get the feedback, which is only for them to use. So it helps them build their academic practice and their, their skills in writing. Um, and it didn't form any part of the, their assessment um, per se. So if I just move on. Oh, I think I went two slides, sorry. And um, this, I'm afraid it is not particularly clear here, but um, uh, you, you can follow up again if you follow up on, on the, the publication and you can also contact. You'll see that in both those, um, if I just go back, in both those um, publications, Denise Whitelock is the is the, the lead author. And in fact, it was Denise that was meant to give this talk originally. So uh, it's a, a late apology in terms of presentation, but, um, but I, I'm, I'm not Denise. <laughs> and um, uh, as she couldn't be here. So um, just just moving forward again. So open essay is actually if, if we look there, there's four different images. This is the graphical output. And um, if you put 50 identical sentences in into the system, it will give you this kind of cloud where everything's well, all the nodes are, are quite well dispersed. And at the other end of the scale, if you put um, a prize winning essay in from Stanford University, it gives you this very condensed um, set of, of points. And um, when you, you work with a tool and you start to, to look at what it's offering, you, you start to, to look at the way in which the, um, these nodes are, are being um, drawn of your work. So and it helps you to look at what you need to target. So it might be that the way in which you write the conclusion or it might be the which way you, you bring up themes and re respond to themes or carry themes through. Um, a low mark, a low um, marking, uh, scoring essay um, would is it at the bottom left hand corner and a high marking essay at the, the right hand side. So not quite up to Stanford level, but but getting closer. And so this is a very simple uh, way of offering feedback. And once a student understands how to interpret this, then it can give them very powerful um, ideas about how they can improve their, their work. The next slide, um, again, this is low quality because it was just taken from another slide, um, actually shows that the submitted work, and it's just been carried over into a, a text, a plain text format, and then the text, particular elements of the text have been highlighted with annotations so that a student could look at that, um, that overview and, and get some ideas about their, their work from that. So the, this is one tool that I, I think has, has value. Um, it has value in improving um, the integrity of our, our work and the students' work as, as they develop into their academic practice, um, but it's not directly related to authentication. The um, Open Mentor is the other one that, that I wanted to just say a little about, and that's to do with um, the feedback that students and um, tutors give on, on their students' work. So, Students tend to, to submit their work in Word, uh, although there's a whole variety of formats that they can use depending on the kind of work. It might just be an image for some things, or it might be a video or an audio recording, and, and Open Mentor wouldn't work on, on those. But for, for those assignments where their work is submitted in Word, um, and tutors will tend to use the, um, you know, the annotations that you can use within Word to, to, to put in their feedback comments about particular parts of, of the student's work. Uh, as well as later on giving a summary, but the, these these feedback uh, comments, I think tutors um, 
don't get a lot of support um, uh, because it would it would mean they, they might get some support as they start out on tutoring in terms of what to, things to kind of say and pick up on. But um, but from day to day as they're marking work, they, they're not scrutinised closely, and and we wouldn't want to do that. Um, but a tool like this would would looks through all their comments and it, it uses a, a well-established framework to, to compare those against and and it, again it will give a graphical output on, on each of the elements in that framework showing where they they've um you know done really well or, or uh, not so well compared to an ideal kind of um, set of feedback and and that can be again something that tutors could just use and they could use to help develop the way in which they give feedback without having um, a, a outside scrutiny of their work. And so that can help develop their practice. Um, oh, OK, <laughs> last slide. Um, I, I just thought that, that partly what we're talking about in, in, with, with this use of data is, is trying to find um, the structures and the patterns that we can, we can use to the good we're within these and that and I thought that this this image helps represent what I felt about that. Um, the the other images I used I got just given the references there as well. So I'll stop there and Sandra if you spotted any questions that I need to answer first of all then please do say. Thank you Chris. Uh, yes please uh, the question is are these uh, tools open mentor and open is generally available or just for use within the uh, Open University? Okay, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they'd be available for anyone to try. Um, I, th I think I, I'm not sure. I, I think there's been an, an issue about the, the servers that we've stored everything on and 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 how well supported those are. But I think if, if anyone wants to so to have a go at using those, then if you contact me or Denise Whitelock, um, then it, it, we, we should be able to arrange it. And, um, and if you do, then it all it helps us make a stronger case as well for getting better support. So it might help us provide a better service. So by all means, just contact us if, you, if you're at all interested in trying this. Okay, thank you. And the second question is regarding this copycat software. Uh, how much mm -hmm. information, uh, additional information is provided within this uh, software? Uh, okay, no, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I haven't got an example I can easily show, readily show you, um, not least because it would involve real students' work. But um, uh, uh, so what we do is when we when we set up our assignments and our assessments, we define what we want this software, this copy capture software to compare each submitted piece of work with. And it might just be, depending on the on the assignment, it might just be that we want to, it to be compared to all the other pieces of work that the students in that cohort have been submitting. Or it might be that we want to, it to be compared with all the work that's ever been submitted um, on that module. Or it might be that we feel that there's another module um, in our curriculum that has a very similar type of question or, or that, that we'd want to compare it to as well. And so we can define that when we set it up. Where the output from, from the software shows the, um, the student's work and it shows where uh, words have been repeat, uh, well, similar combinations of words are also found in any of the, those other work that's been compared. And, and it's color coded to show the sort of the, the severity uh, of that. And it, it then gives a, a summary uh, as well. And so you can, anything with a particularly low value, you obviously can ignore, but anything where the value is, well, over what, what you deem is significant for that piece of work, then, then you, you start to filter, to look through them and start to make judgments over whether you think it's um, these are just the kind of words that students would normally write when they're writing, or whether it looks like it's something you need to follow up more detail. So again, this is flag just helping filter what we what we have to focus, put our focus on. Thank you, Chris. These are really good examples. How can we prevent and ensure that the students have all the additional information in order to avoid possibility of plagiarism? And I think this is very, very good example. 
So um, we are getting to the end of uh, our uh, today's event, and maybe for the end I will ask each of the speakers just, just with one or two sentences to uh, summarize or uh, maybe to uh, give opinion how to deal uh, with the today with the uh, with plagiarism with the uh, academic integrity. How can we enhance academic integrity? today in relation to, to uh, misbehavior uh, uh, of the students, but also uh, of the teaching staff. So, um, uh, Frederick, we'll, can we start with you? Did you hear me? You have to turn on the mic, don't forget. Okay. Did you hear me? You, you cannot hear me. Please try to talk. Uh, can you hear me now? Ah, yeah. Hello. Okay, I just... Now, yes, yes, now I, I can. I just wanted to say we are going to uh, summarize at the end today with one or two sentences. Uh, the topic of, of uh, which we have discussed, and um, maybe uh, what is your opinion and or your advice how we can avoid um, uh, misbehavior uh, in academic community regarding the plagiarism uh, or dishonesty and so. Uh, uh, may I I, we can hear you, please. It's cutting out. Uh, can I can I speak? Yes. Uh, uh, I think two things uh, to reduce uh, uh, to reduce plagiarism. Two things: uh, education, that is, the use of new technologies like face recognition. And uh, what are the other things? Uh, keystroke. All of that is necessary, as well as teaching uh, the students uh, what the what the rules of the game are. Uh, I was delighted to learn new things from Irene and Chris about uh, studies being done about uh, academic integrity in other parts of the world. Uh, the problem of integrity is not only treated. Uh, as an overall overarching question, and with research published in in generalist journals, but it's also uh, to be found in subject areas like chemistry and history and and so forth. So, I'm just to to follow to be able to accompany research done in Europe, uh, Asia, and, and other places in, in North America. Uh, a, a seminar like this is really wonderful because I, I've learned from the bibliographies and the words presented by my colleagues on the table here has been very educational and I hope that some of the things that perhaps uh, I reported on uh, was interesting for them. And it'd be because bibliographic control in medicine and hard science is very well done. Since most of the publications are in English, you know, everybody wants to publish English so as to be seen. This is not true in the humanities and, and social sciences where there's still linguistic, linguistic and, and cultural things. So we need some kind of way to, it'd be wonderful to get really good bibliographic control over uh, worldwide global efforts at reducing uh, uh, offenses in academic integrity. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, Irene, your point for summarizing today's event? Yes, it's been, it's been really interesting. And uh, as, um, as Frederick said, it, it's, it's always a pleasure to hear other researchers talk and, and, and other experts talk in this field. Um, and, and there's always a, always a lot to learn from each other, so it's, it's, that's amazing. I would say that the two things I would say is there needs to be institutionally, there needs to be a, a, a holistic institutional strategy backed by the, by the senior management. So to take from the top with, with strong... Um, and resourcing as well uh, to to um, tackle the problem, 
but involving students. It's really important that students are involved in it. We, in the UK, we have students' unions, and, and they are they are always very interested in getting involved in this kind of initiative. So uh, that, that, that's the thing I would say. But also within in, the institution, strong, consistent policies across an institution, um, and make sure and communication about those in clear language and communication about those, not just to catch the cheats, but really to change behaviour and to, to instil um, the, the joy of learning. That's really why we're all here, why we all care so much about higher education, um, is because it's important for everybody. It's important for wider society as well. Thank you, Irene. Yes, it's very important and I agree with you. And for final, Chris, your last word summarising. Okay, I think I'd probably just suggest two things, that in, um, which I think overlap with what's already been said. But uh, I think, firstly, um, the culture within the institution is, is critical. And uh, I think the, or the culture, particularly amongst the academics, academics in the institution, and because they're involved in developing the courses and the teaching and the assessments, and they set um, the culture within the courses. So, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, as has already been said, um, is to ensure that students understand. Um, and so that means providing them information, information at the right time, the right level of detail. Um, I don't think we'd expect uh, a first year student to, to deliver the same kind of um, expertise in these skills that we would a postgraduate student to studying their masters um, we, we'd expect them all to be developing and their, their skills and to have their understanding of these issues and to know that it, it's important they're important and that the university treats them as important as well so I think they're just they're the two that I'd, I'd highlight thank you very much Chris yeah I, if I can summarize so uh, issue of education and providing understanding uh, among students and between students and teacher and mentor, uh, then um, communication is such a, a culture which you have to take to the culture as well, not only within the institution but within the society. Often in online courses we have uh, students from very different uh, cultures and uh, you have to combine and know how to approach uh, this culture uh, as well. The policies at the institutional level or at the national level also can very much influence or even at European level or, or global level. And what we uh, have to think about is prevention more than punishment. And uh, in order to be able to find the right solution, research is very important and uh, 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 exchanging uh, the results and uh, know-how uh, uh, also is very important. So uh, I would like to thank all of you today for participating in this event, to my speakers, Frederick, Irene, and Chris, and all the, um, you uh, for uh, participating and uh, commenting, uh, uh, giving your opinions and asking questions. The recording of the, of the event will be available at the web pages of Eden and uh, SEPTA, and I hope uh, to see you in some, uh, another event in future. So thank you again. And bye from Zagreb.